Thanks very much for the intro, Steve, and thanks for hosting the discussion today. Special thanks, of course, to Amy Wax and to Charles Murray for coming down here to discuss, I think, a very important topic. I'm personally excited about it because I have not heard them address immigration directly, at least not very often. So I'm looking forward what to it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of on the edge of my seat here. I'm going to rush through my own presentation. No, uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to that. When we were putting together the panel, Steve said that we can do it as long as I pick two guest speakers that have a reputation for being completely politically correct. And so I, I followed that advice completely. I, I would never go against what Steve has to say. <laughs> Um, to, uh, to, to motivate the discussion, I think it's best actually to dive right into the first chart, and I promise there won't be too many charts. So what you see here is the percentage of prime age men who are not in the labor force over time. So what does all that mean? Well, not in the labor force means that you are neither working nor looking for work. That is distinct from the unemployment rate, as many of you know, which refers to people who are looking for work. So why do we focus on this set of people? Uh, not to imply they're the only people with problems, but uh, they are the people with the least excuse for not working. Uh, prime age means 25 to 54. And I chose that range where there's a common range uh, because if you're over 54, maybe you took an early retirement. And if you're under 25, maybe you're still in school or you took a few years off to find yourself. You, you joined the Peace Corps and moved to Thailand, something crazy like that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's the, the, the range we look at. And the reason we look at men uh, is that, uh, for better or for worse, women still have the majority of the childcare responsibilities. Men do not have that excuse. So all the analysis we talk about today will be focused on uh, prime age men. And you can see from the chart that, uh, that, that the, the percentage not in the labor force has been going steadily, gradually up. Not a lot of big peaks, not, no spikes, not something that the media find very interesting to talk about, but it's been slowly going up. And if you follow social policy, this is no surprise at all. There's lots of people who have been uh, talking about this from a sort of a scholarly level. And the other thing that should be no surprise uh, for people who follow this is the fact that this is something that is primarily, though not exclusively, a, a low-skill problem. You can see this starts in 1994 now, and we see the blue line is high school dropouts, the gray line you see high school graduates, both of them starting higher and moving up, whereas college uh, has remained basically steady. Now, what I try to do in the paper, and it's a pretty simple paper, just making a couple of basic points that I think are important for the, the discussion, and one of them is, there's an immigration angle to this. You'll notice that in the uh, vertical axis there, it says percentage of natives who are not in the labor force. And by the way, the reason we start in 94, that's the first time we can actually distinguish immigrants and natives. But if you look at immigrants, then it's the same chart and the same scale, but there's basically no difference in the labor force participation for uh, different uh, immigrant education levels. And of course, the levels overall are also low. So before I go on, you might say, wait a minute, Jason, you know, these educational categories, can you really compare them over time? You know, I mean, to be a, a high school dropout in the 1960s means something different than it does in 2015. There was far more people back then who were dropouts, and the average skill level of, of dropouts in the 1960s was much closer to the average skill level of Americans. So isn't it possible that that there's a creaming effect, this is one of the reactions I originally got, that uh, you just have the best people moving up and leaving the, uh, the least hardworking people behind such that uh, it's not really that, that the lower, uh, the bottom part of the skill distribution is getting worse, but only that uh, you're leaving behind sort of the, the least industrious people. And one way to look at that is to abandon the education categories and just look at percentile rankings. So what this is, it's a percentile rank based on educational attainment. So if you compare, say, the bottom 10% in 1965 to the bottom 10% in 2015, you have a, a consistently sized groups over time. There's no creaming effect. And you can see that it tells the same basic story. Uh, the green line is bottom 10%. The blue line is what I would call the bottom quintile. It's the bottom 20%. And you can see that uh, the lower the quintiles have the greater uh, labor force dropout, whereas the higher ones show a slight increase, but not a lot. I will say the one thing that surprised me about this chart was the gray line. That's the middle range, 40 to 60%. So even that is going up now. And so as I said, this is primarily a low skill problem, though not exclusively. So, 
oh, okay, and if you do the same thing with immigrants here, you see uh, the blue and orange lines are the bottom quintiles of natives. You see them going up since 94. The yellow and gray lines are the immigrants who are in those same skill groups, and you see not much change. So what I wanted to do with the paper is kind of drill down into these work time differences a little bit more, rather than just sort of the binary, are you in the labor force, are you not in the labor force? Uh, I would actually, actually know how many hours are people in various skill groups actually working? And you might say, well, how in the world do you do that? Because you, know, you have questions like, how many hours per week do you usually work? But that's so open-ended, it's so vague. But nevertheless, uh, there is a data set called the American Time Use Survey which I consider to be a underused survey, uh, that is a time diary. And so it actually asks respondents. It says, you know, what did you do then? And then what did you do? And then what did you do? And how long were you doing it? And the Census Bureau then categorizes those responses. So you have a nice sort of systematic, uh, consistent comparison you can make. And I've done this, incidentally, for other kinds of comparisons. I compared public and private sector workers on their amount of work time with this data set, and the results were interesting. You always know when you really did a good job when the other side ignores it, you know, because usually they, they come up with some kind of talking point, right? N nevertheless, you know, it almost makes me wonder, should I put a slight error in just to get them get attention? You know. Uh, anyway, so um, I, I did this for immigrants and natives by education level. Now, this chart requires a little bit of explanation. Uh, it says equivalent full-time weeks per year. So I thought it would not be very interpretable to tell people how many total hours somebody works in a year. Uh, so all I did was I just divided that number by 40, assuming the, like a 40-hour regular work week, so that then you get equivalent work weeks. And if you look in the native column, you can see that there's a very clear correlation between skill level and work time perhaps not too surprising, that the less than high school category at only 34.8 uh, equivalent weeks per year. And remember, the high school dropouts at this point are, are really the bottom of the bottom. Okay, there's only about 7 or 8% of prime age men are in that category now. So we're talking about a very low skill group of people. And they appear to be idle about one third of the year. Remember, prime age men. Uh, it gets better for high school grads, and as you can see, it's a uh, particularly high for people with advanced degrees at 52.8 uh, uh, weeks per year, which is actually more than the total number of weeks in a year. And of course, the reason for that is they work more than 40 hours per week. But if you go to the immigrant column, you again see a big difference, that there's not really a clear correlation uh, uh, in, in terms of across educational levels. You have around 50 weeks per year for the immigrants, really only getting up there for the advanced degree immigrants. Now, this is for 2003 through 2015, because I, wa I wanted to combine the samples together because it's not easy. Uh, the samples are kind of small for the American Time Use Survey. And you want to be careful with trends. So uh, you, you don't want to get a bunch of random noise and start ascribing some grand theory to it, which is a popular pastime for some people. But you can get some, uh, some semblance of, of what's going on if you group some years together to get big enough samples. And you can see here, this is natives that even just over that 12-year uh, period, uh, there is a, a pronounced drop-off for the dropouts and for the high school graduates. And obviously, that's due to the recession in the middle of there. But uh, there's not been much recovery. Or it's been less than robust, so to speak. And once again, the same comparison for immigrants. And you can see that there's been some decline uh, during the recession, but not nearly as dramatic and also a better recovery. And one more chart. Uh, this is another way of looking at uh, how the replacement in the labor force is going. Uh, if you look at the far right column, the blue column is going to tell you the native share of all dropouts in the United States. That's 52%. And the orange column is the native share of hours worked by dropouts in the United States. You can see that's only 40%, meaning that immigrants are working 60%. And that share of the hours worked has been going down faster than the share uh, in the overall population. So um, what does this all mean? Well, what I would say is that it's fairly inarguable that immigrants are replacing uh, natives, particularly low-skill natives, in the workforce. Um, but notice my careful use of the term replace here. I did not say push out. We can't prove that with this kind of data. I mean, it would be convenient for me to say that. It would be nice to say immigrants are the cause of all of our problems, but it's just not necessarily true. Certainly, you can uh, come up with a 
plausible scenario in which immigrants are, are causing some of this problem in that you could say immigrants are coming in, depressing the wage so that it's below the level that natives would want to work. Uh, I think that probably is part of the problem, but it's not the entire problem. And there's a number of other explanations out there. I will not try to adjudicate all of them, but it's, I think, worth it to point out what some of those are. So on the left, we often hear that manufacturing jobs have left the cities. We hear that uh, unionization rates are declining. And on the right, it's more about the welfare state. It's more about social expectations for work having changed over time, uh, all of which I think are perfectly plausible explanations. Now, the White House actually put out a report recently on this labor force participation problem, not talking about immigration very much, of course. But they, they mentioned, I mean, they had this whole report, and it was a pretty good one. I mean, it, I recommend reading it. But it did come to a conclusion that I think it would not have come to had they considered the immigration angle. And one of their conclusions was, that, it, that it's just a declining demand for low-skill labor. It's just that there's just not much demand anymore for manual laborers and such, and so that's why the wage is going down. That's why you know, there's not many people working them. Um, I think that had, you, had they thought a lot about immigration, they might not have come to that conclusion, only because we know from, from these slides that immigrants are finding plenty of work, even at the low-skill level, and they're coming from very far away to get that work, so they must have be, be hearing about it. Now, actually, ironically, or maybe I should say hypocritically, uh, the White House has in the past talked about the, the uh, shortage of low-skill workers. They talk about that in the context, of course, of immigration policy. So three years ago, when pushing for an amnesty and a guest workers and so on, they told us about how low-skill labor, laborers are hard to find, that these, these unfilled jobs, there are crops rotting in the fields, we can't find anybody. But then, then three years later, years later, they tell us there's a surplus of low-skill labor. So uh, I think I think they don't really have their story straight, but I'm not sure that it really matters. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to try to further adjudicate all those things. My point, really, with the paper is to say that, that as natives have been dropping out of the labor force, immigrants have been the backstop. They've been the crutch. And Im immigration has basically helped to devalue the problem in people's minds. Because as you bring in immigrants to replace people, those industries go on working as they have before, for the most part. Uh, and, and you just don't have people necessarily feeling like they need to care about the problem. Imagine the reaction if we did not have low-skill immigrants coming in, if there were not a, a large supply available to work. I would think that politicians and employers would be very, very interested suddenly in getting natives back to work and back into the mainstream of society. There are some tantalizing sort of microcosm examples of that happening. Uh, one of them actually was mentioned in uh, George Borjas' new book, which I recommend. Uh, it was a, a, a chicken processing plant in Georgia. This was uh, during the second, second uh, term of the Bush administration. And a uh, long story short, basically there was a raid on the plant and the plant lost 75% of its workers overnight, or practically overnight. And so what happened? And they wanted to keep running the plant, right? So what happened was uh, the employer there made a very, very strong concerted effort to get natives to come work there. And it wasn't just wages. I mean, they did raise wages, but they advertised heavily. They offered free transportation to the plant. They even offered free housing uh, for the workers to come, you know, live right next to the plant if they wanted to. And it worked to some degree. I mean, a lot of natives did sign up. This was a, uh, a predominantly black area of Georgia. Um, and, you know, I don't want to pretend this is a completely happy story. I mean, so what happened was they, they were able to recruit a lot of natives, but there was still some friction. There was tension because the natives complained a lot uh, still about the working conditions and the wages. And whether you think those are legitimate complaints or not, I think depends a lot on your perspective on things. But my point is this was something that was a good start. And maybe that could actually happen on a national level if you had a national level immigration policy similar uh, to what happened in Georgia. Now, incidentally, um, it's not just employers that might have a reaction. It could be politicians as well reacting to what the employers are complaining about. There are a number of policies out there uh, aimed at trying to get natives back to work that might work. I'm not saying they will, but they're on, on the back burner somewhat. Uh, I used to uh, work at a conservative think tank. It, the name is, escapes me now, but I, I did work there for like three years or so. And, I, uh, and at the time, we were really pushing uh, work requirements for means-tested benefits. And so obviously that was done with uh, AFDC, which became TANF in the mid-90s. But you could do it, do it for other things, like food stamps. If you're an able-bodied man, uh, you know, why, why should you not be required to work if you want to receive food stamps? So these are the kinds of policies that I think would suddenly get a very strong look if we had a system where we did not 
rely on immigration as a backstop or a crutch. I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm saying it's something that you know we should try, and we're not trying at, at this point. I just want to wrap up uh, by uh, pointing to uh, one of the common arguments in favor of low-skill immigration, which is that it will push natives upward, that it will it will cause natives to get high-skill jobs because they'll just have to because they're facing more competition. And uh, it is true, of course, that education levels for natives have been going up. And there's been a big push to get natives graduating from high school, but uh, it doesn't seem to have helped with the dropout rate uh, from, I mean, the labor force dropout rate. And it doesn't seem to have really improved skills very much as you lower the standards for graduation and test scores are stagnant, but nevertheless, people are still getting those degrees. The point is that we have a situation where there's always going to be a certain portion of the population, a non-trivial portion, that are not going to be able to respond to immigration by moving up in skills. Uh, there are people who are just not academically oriented in a way that is, that's going to work for them. And we always are going to have people like that who are left behind in our knowledge economy, in a high-tech economy. Our challenge is to find, uh, as Charles might say, a valued place in society for that group of people. Uh, we are not doing a very good job right now I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I do know that one answer is, uh, I'm sorry, that one answer cannot be uh, to uh, bring in more low-skill immigrants to compete with them and to further devalue their problem in the minds of most people. Thanks. <laughs>